Hello folks, this is Mike. Thanks for tuning in. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to make this. Now this is an on-the-wall storage system for 12-inch vinyl rolls. These rolls are used in crafts, but more particularly they're used in die-cutting machines like your Cricut, Brother, Silhouette, and others. For instance, my wife made this iron-on transfer for my shirt using her Cricut machine. And she's made some really nice projects in wood and in glass and other materials. But her problem was storage. She had these rolls stored in drawers and cubby holes all over her shop. And she asked me for a solution. Of course, my solution was just don't buy anymore. <laughs> but that wasn't the solution she was looking for. So I came up with this. Each 14 and a half inch unit houses 48 rolls, two deep. And the nice thing about it is, once on the shelf, they will not roll off. Even partial rolls will not sag between the little shelves. And you could even store your infusible ink still in the box. And this unit will fit right behind this 32 inch door. So stay tuned and I'll show you how to build it. I'm in the craft room now, and I've got our prototype unit, just finished this, and we're about to test fit it on the wall. Now this unit still needs a little work. I still have a little bowing of the side here I need to take out. But I want to show you a few features of the cabinet before we finish it. I think it'll probably be easier to see now. First, the unit's 74 inches high, it's 14 and a half inches wide, and it's 4 inches deep. This back is 5 millimeter Luan plywood and it's set in a rabbit around the back. The reason for the rabbit is you'll notice you don't see the edge of the panel. It makes a nice neat appearance. Now you'll notice the little shelves. Now these are set into a 3 8 inch dado. And the dado is angled at 5 degrees toward the back of the cabinet. The reason we do that is so that when you put your vinyl roll on the cabinet it will automatically roll to the back. You want to worry about the rolls falling on the floor. And a little later in the video we're going to make a router jig to use to make these angled slots in the side. I needed to find some sort of plywood or material that would fit in those grooves well. And you know today when they make plywood, quarter inch plywood is never really one quarter inch is thick. <laughs> so I made one of these. So I routed some one quarter inch and five millimeter slots on the end of a scrap board and I cut the end off and I took it with me to the lumber yard to test fit on some different panels. Now oddly enough, the only good fit I got in the whole store was one quarter inch MDF board. So that's what we're using. My first step is to rip our boards to the right width. Now each modular unit will have top, bottom, and sides cut out of two eight foot long boards. The sides will be four inches wide, but I like to rip my board about four and a quarter inches. Oftentimes when you cross cut dados, you get tear out on the edge of the board. So after you route the slots, then you can rip it to exact width. Then I'm going to make a squaring cut on one end of the board. These boards are eight feet long but I'm not going to cut them down yet into, you know, sides, tops, and bottoms. We're going to need the extra length. The jig we're going to use is too long to cut the last few dados on each side if you cut it to exact length. This is the jig we're using to cut the angled dados. Now it features this angled piece on top, and I'm using half-inch material for the base, and then a piece of straight 1x2 for the guide fence. The nice thing about the flush cutting construction of the jig is that it allows you to use it to lay out your slots as well as cut them. To make the jig, I'm first going to cut the angled top piece. Our cabinet sides are 4 inches wide, so I'm going to make this jig about 6 inches deep. On the table saw, adjust the miter gauge to 5 degrees. Cross cut and simply flip it over and cut the other end. This process will ensure that the angles will be a mirror image of each other. Use the same process if you're using a miter saw. Set the angle at 5 degrees, cut one side, flip and cut the other. To determine the length of the base piece, we need to first measure our router base. 
Measure the distance from the center of your router chuck to the outside edge of the base. Now, mine is three inches. The angled top piece is six inches wide, so I need to add about maybe three and a quarter inches on each side, or a minimum of 12 and a half inch long. This will allow me to trim off the ends flush with my router bit. When you assemble the jig, make sure that the edge of the base is flush with the edge of the wedged top piece. Also, make sure that the 1x1 guide fence is also flush with the rest of the jig. If not, your slots won't line up when you cut them on your boards. Clamp it and screw it together. Now take your router with your quarter inch bit that you're going to cut your slots with and carefully cut the excess away. Be sure to cut from right to left. Now your jig is ready to use. Now we're going to test the jig for accuracy. Measure down four inches from the top end of each board and make a line across. Now clamp the boards together with the ends flush with each other and the lines should meet. With your jig, carefully draw a line from each side toward the center of the board. If your jig is made right, you should have a perfect triangle. The lines will intersect. I'm marking the bottom end at 74 inches, but I'm not going to cut it off yet. We mainly want to do this to make sure we don't cut our dados past this point. Uh, starting at your 4 inch line, lay out one board with marks at 3 inch intervals down the length of the board. Then using the jig, uh, draw the lines on both sides of the board, taking particular care to ensure that the lines meet in the middle. If we get this right, our dados will match when we plow them. Now this angled line we cut is for the bottom of the dado, so make sure your jig is not positioned between the line and the top of the board. Be sure to use sturdy clamps with lots of holding power. Light duty and squeeze tight clamps may allow the jig to move while you're cutting. I like to clamp my jig into place where my line is just visible. And also if you cut left to right with your router, it's easier to keep it tight against the jig. Check the dado to make sure your cut is 3 eighths of an inch deep and test it with a piece of your shelf material to make sure it's tight enough in the groove. Be aware that when you move to the other side piece, you'll have to reverse your jig. So notice that the other, the other board went on this side. Now the angles are opposite, so we have to move to this side to cut our slots. And of course the edge of the jig will correspond to the mark on the board. When your slots are all cut, you can cut the boards off to the 74 inch length. Here I'm setting a stop on the miter saw so I will get a precision cut. So lay your boards out and butt them up against each other uh, with the ends flush and make sure your dados match up. The tops and bottoms are cut at 13 inches. And I'm also cutting a top brace. And this is just a one by two piece that will be 13 inches long also. Next I ripped my boards to exactly four inches wide, making sure I ripped off all the areas with the tear out. I used a half inch straight bit and used my router guide and I routed off a five millimeter by half inch rabbit for my back panel, making sure I left a quarter inch lip on each end of my side piece. Of course the top and bottom piece will not require this lip. Now I wanted to get my rabbit just perfect, so I practiced on some scrap board until I got it just right. And you may want to do the same. Now's a good time to sand the pieces before we assemble everything. Now we can put it all together. I'm going to use a little wood glue on the joints and I'm going to secure them with a 2 inch brad nailer. So make sure that the 1x2 brace is inset 5 millimeters to allow for the rabbit and the back. Before we install the back, we're going to install the little shelf tabs, uh, which is much easier with the back off. The tabs are two and a quarter by three and a half inches. And you can make yours a little longer if you wish. I didn't want them to crowd the loo on back. Uh, you'll need 46 tabs for each modular unit. I set my saw blade at 5 degrees and my fence 3 and a half inches from the blade and ripped my quarter inch MDF panel into strips. 
I set a stock on the miter saw and cut each strip into two and a quarter inch pieces. Now when you glue them up, be sure to dry fit each tab to make sure that the five degree end is aligned parallel to the side's front. I'm using yellow wood glue. Make sure that you coat each side of the dado and also apply glue to the tab itself. This will make the strongest possible bond. Clean the excess glue off with a wet rag or towel. And I'm using a square cut piece of scrap to make sure that the tabs are set perpendicular to the side. Now once all the tabs are in and dry, use a sharp chisel and square up the corners of the rabbits. The back is cut at 14 inches by 73 and a half inches, but we will probably have to trim it slightly to ensure a good fit. It should be slightly loose to allow for expansion. And you'll notice that the cabinet is pre-finished. After my first dry fit, I removed the back panel and painted it. It's, it's, it's very difficult to finish with the back installed. Because we used our nail gun and permanently fastened the cabinet together, it's, it's a little tougher to get it squared up. So I built this apparatus to help. It consists of a couple of 1x2s, one of which is clamped to the edge of the board. Uh, one side of the cabinet is clamped down and standard wooden wedges are used to square up the case. Now you can buy these shims at lumber yards and home centers. And measure across the corners of your cabinet and when you have the same reading in both directions, you're squared up. Now this doodad I've got here was bought from the Rockler store and, and it helps make this a more precision process. Uh, but I find I have to tape it down or it tends to slip or fall off. Now we use a smaller countersink and we drill holes, uh, one in each corner and then in 8 to 12 inch intervals around the back. And I'm using 3 quarter inch screws to secure it in place. Now you could use maybe 1 inch brad nails here if you wish with your nail gun. Now my baseboards are 6 inches high. So I'm using a 6 and a half inch spacer underneath the cabinets uh, so we can clear those. We set the units in place and I'm going to shim the bottoms uh, until we can get them square and level on the wall. Now we're almost ready to hang the cabinet. I'm going to use a one half inch wide countersink on the top holes. And this will allow me to cap them off with some wooden buttons when we're done. And just a regular drill bit at the bottom. Uh, we're going to use dome head screws there. Now it is best to mount these in wall studs. Uh, but I've checked my wall with the stud finder, and I'm going to have to use hollow wall anchors. So I've set my screws about two inches from the edges of the cabinet. Once we drill these mounting holes, we can move the cabinets out of the way. Before doing that, I made uh, positioning marks on the wall uh, around my cabinet. And I also took a picture of the shim arrangement, so hopefully I can reduplicate that. So using the holes we just drilled, we can tap out and install the hollow wall anchors. I'm using a toggler type here. I've had really good luck with these. Uh, now we can reposition our cabinets in place and run in your mounting screws. And I'm using a number six by two and a half inch wood screw at the top here, which works great with these toggler anchors. And on bottom, I'm just using the screws they provided. Now we can remove the shims and the spacer, and I'm going to tap in the buttons and paint them, and basically we're done. Well, my project is done. It's mounted on the wall. I've got it loaded, and best of all, my wife really loves it. But I have one small problem there. When I open my door, the door handle makes contact with the cabinet wall. Now to fix that, I'm going to go to the lumber yard and buy a three-quarter inch rubber or plastic bumper and I'm going to put that at the point of impact and that will fix that problem. Now if this isn't happening to you, you will still probably need at the very least to buy an extra long door stop, four to four and a half inches long, and possibly combine that with a rubber bumper on the back of your door. That will protect your door and your cabinet. And remember, this doesn't have to go behind the door. Using this concept, you can adjust the dimensions to fit your needs. Uh, you could even go deeper with more rows. Just remember that for every additional row, you'll need to add about two inches in width. 
Well, now, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've gotten something from it. Uh, feel free to leave me a question or a comment, and I will answer you. Also, be sure to go below and like our video, and if you haven't already, be sure to click that subscribe button and ring that bell. And until next time, folks, thanks for watching.